and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, possibly future, if um, you know, we can figure it out. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything. And I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hey, everybody. And Steve Marinucci, probably the world's only full-time Beatles reporter. You can read his reports in Billboard.com, Axis.com, Variety, Goldmine, always more titles being added. Hello, Steve. (laughs) Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. And today we have a special guest. Steve is the only remaining full-time reporter about the Beatles. We have the premier biographer of the Beatles, who probably is even more the only full-time writer about the Beatles um, in all kinds of capacities. And that, you probably guessed, is Mark Lewison. Hello, Mark. Hello. Hello. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. Thank you. Our yeah. Transatlantic Skype link. And Mark is here, I guess, principally to talk about um, the two-volume version of All These Years, Tune In, uh, the, f- the first installment of his trilogy uh, about the Beatles. And um, All These Years in England came out in both the two-volume version and the Cut down single volume version in um, 2013. And American fans of the Beatles and people who just want to know the story, uh, who really wanted everything, had to get the British one uh, of the two volume one from Amazon UK or, or some British bookseller. And for a while, they were really hard to get because I think they sold out pretty quickly first. Is that true, Mark? Yeah, they were printed in limited um, because they're expensive to pr- to produce. They they didn't want to overprint, so they printed. A, a, I can't remember exactly how many, a couple of thousand maybe, and then they did sell quite quickly. And I think we're up to the fourth or fifth printing now. Mm-hmm. Again, still they've they've only ever been done in relatively small quantities, but it's always possible to do more. And they they're just anxious to avoid being left with unsold stocks, so they do them in relatively small batches. Right. Mm. I do remember people trying to find them in lots of emails going back and forth and posts on the Internet saying, how do you get this? Where do you get this? And people having a a hard time originally. Um, But now this edition has come out in the United States as well. Um, So first of all, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, Because I think this is the one that really, if you had your way, this would have just been the, the standard edition, right? I suppose so, but it would have been impractical to expect anybody but those who really, really want to know, impractical to expect though everybody, the mass population, to be buying a book of this magnitude, this size. It runs to 1,700 pages. Right. So it is, by definition, kind of beyond the mass market, and it was clearly essential that I produced a book that was something that people would not be too put off reading i mean the abridged version of this book is still pretty substantial but it's about half the size of of this full edition right and it came about really because i just decided to write what i felt needed to be written i spent many years doing research for tune in uh and then when it came the way i work is to do all the research first and then do all the writing uh so i did all this deep research and then began to write up what I'd found and what I felt the story needed to say and realized within a chapter or two that if I kept on writing to that extent, I was going to quite significantly exceed the word count that I'd been given Mm -hmm. of 250,000 words, which most biographies are something in the region of 150,000. So 250,000 was always going to be quite a big book. Mm -hmm. But I reached 250,000. I don't recall exactly, but I'm not sure that the Beatles were even in Hamburg yet. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I just kept on going. And I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm stacking up a problem here for myself because 
the publishers won't want it like this, but I'll just write what I think needs to be done and then face the problem later. And I was quite sanguine about that. Uh -huh. And um, and then I turned in a manuscript of 780,000 words um, when yes. I was in the publisher had only wanted 250,000. So then I really did have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. What was the first thing they said when they got the 780,000 word version? Well, I have two principal partnership publishers, um, one in Britain and one in the US. Mm -hmm. And they both said, well, oh, my goodness, um, what are we going to do? Because we really do want a book of about 250,000 words. But thankfully, my British publisher, Little Brown, said, though we do want the smaller book, the word smaller is had to be used advisedly here, but the, the, the smaller version. Because um, also keeping in we, mind it goes up to the end of 1962, so it's really a smaller third of a book. <laughs> yeah, I mean. and, and in fact, uh, this first volume was meant to go up to the end of 63, mm. uh, but which would have probably added about another 250,000 words or so. It probably would have broken a million to get to the end of 63. Mm -hmm. So I brought back the end of the book to the end of 62, in order to at least part alleviate the problem. But still, I did have a big problem. But it was great. I was greatly um, relieved to hear from Little Brown in London that they would publish the entirety of it as well. That they, whilst they wanted the, the cut down edition for the mainstream, um, for the mass public, they would publish the full edition for those who were prepared to you know pay a little bit more of a price for it so on that basis that it was going to be coming out i was able to edit it without too much grief because had i thought that what i was cutting out of the book would never be read by anybody it would have just been too painful yeah so the fact that I knew people would still be able to see the whole thing uh, allowed me the opportunity to make the cuts that were needed for the mass market edition. Mm -hmm. Are there any differences between the American edition that's just come out and the full British edition? No. And in fact, the, the version that has just been published finally in the United States uh, and Canada is the British edition. Uh, with British spellings and so on, and British punctuation, mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't. The, the interior of the book is is not altered at all. Okay, so no new intro or anything, because I think the paperback had a new intro, didn't it? The paperback of the smaller edition when that came no, out. No, no. Dis despite what it sounds like, I'm actually anxious to avoid there being a multiplicity of, of editions because I think that does confuse the marketplace. Okay. So I, I can honestly tell you that except for a, a couple of little errors or, and, and grammatical or, or uh, typographical errors that were corrected with the paperback, we essentially still only have two editions. So There's the mainstream, which is identical in Britain and America, but for the Americanization of certain spellings. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this extended edition, so-called, which is identical in wherever you buy it. Okay. So, And I've not confused the marketplace with new introductions or revisions of any kind. Okay. Um, eventually, years to come, I may take an opportunity to add some new information that's come to light since publication of TuneIn, but I'm not going to confuse the market by doing that now. Okay. So what we do is we go around and each of us ask a bunch of questions. And so I'm going to turn this over to Ken. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Mark, was the editing process real difficult for the mass market? Because I'm sure there are a lot of Beatle fans out there that feel that any information about them is important. How was it for you to trim things down? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of stuff in there that you that you want in the mass market that couldn't go in there. How was that process? Yes, it, well, it was as as I said, it was it was difficult, um, but not impossible. I was always one of those writers who found it hard to cut anything of my own work, uh, and I would need to turn it over to someone else for them to say, "Well, this is the bit that can be cut for length." But in this case, it had to be me that was going to do it because. A book like this is really a tapestry. It's a weave of information and people come in and out of the book. And, and, you know, in order to have somebody come in at a particular juncture, I will actually introduce them earlier 
so I was always conscious of the fact that the the trimming of this book for length had to be done by me because only I would know the ramifications of removing that there is going to affect that page and that page and that page and that page. You do sometimes see books where the editing of it has not been done well and what would have been the second time someone was mentioned ends up being the first time because the first one got cut. And there's no qualification of that. Uh, and you're reading it and you, it suddenly jars because you're reading about someone that you don't even know who they are. So I was very aware that this job had to be done by me because only I knew the ramifications of every single little snip. Oh. But I actually enjoyed the challenge of it and it took about three months. But being that I do liken this book to a tapestry of, of people and places and information, I not only had to make sure that the cuts were consistent, but that for every cut in this cloth, I would stitch it back up again so you couldn't see that anything was missing. Oh. And only the author could do that. So although it was difficult, like I said earlier, because I knew the full version was going to be available for people, it wasn't so bad. Right. Is there any chance that while you're doing the work now for volume two, you've discovered new information that could have fit into volume one? And then, sure. you know, maybe you'd want to append, you know, volume one in some way. Have you encountered that problem? Yeah, it's not a problem. Um, it's an inevitability, really, because mm. no one knows everything um, at any time. You know, even after immersing myself in the Beatles' formative years in the way that I have, I can honestly tell you that there's plenty of stuff that I don't know because, I mean, I don't necessarily know what it is I don't know. But be, <laughs> no one could ever, ever make the bold claim they know everything on any subject. Uh, and a book like that is always likely, by definition, to draw out people uh, and documents and you know handwritten letters and things like that that you couldn't possibly have found were it not for the publication of the book. So TuneIn's publication in 2013 brought a little flurry of, of welcome new material that I would like to have known about, but it simply wasn't possible. And I've got it all carefully stored away and typed up so I know that one day I, I can hopefully use it in a revised edition. But like I said, I don't intend to do any of that yet because I, I think it was, uh, it'll just deflect attention from, you know, from the project. Right. Now, Tune yeah. is, such a, is such an amazing book, and there's so many revelations in there. And you and I have discussed this, and we've talked about it here on this show. To me, the most explosive one of all, in my opinion anyway, is how the Beatles got a record contract. But in your opinion, of all the research that you did, what do you think in the first volume here in Tune In were the most uh, important revelations that you didn't know before? Outside of that, if you want to just share a few. Gosh, there are lots. There are many of them. Um, one of them was the, the discovery that Brian Epstein didn't only manage the Beatles as a group, he managed Lennon and McCartney as songwriters. That was something I hadn't read anywhere, that no one had ever mentioned, that John never mentioned it, or Paul, or Brian, or Dick James, or anybody else. But he had two management contracts going with those four guys, one for the four of them as a group, and one with two of them as a songwriting partnership, which actually explains a lot, and it explains the... The fact that Lennon and McCartney were keen to have this second track running parallel to the Beatles of them writing songs for other people uh, yeah. and having their songs covered. Uh, and indeed, of course, it, it very much created vast sums of money for them that George and Ringo never had access to. Because in, within the Beatles, John and Paul were always far, far wealthier than George and Ringo. So that it was very interesting to find the contract for that and actually to see the, the terms of that contract and to see when they signed it. Uh, and that's the contract that Paul McCartney, who, who though he's never mentioned it, he has referred to uh, an occasion in the apartment, the flat in Liverpool that Brian Epstein had that he let John and Cynthia use when they first got married. And that was where John and Paul kind of made the the conclusive agreement that they would always publish their songs with both their names, even if they'd written them separately. Uh, and it was in that same meeting that, that Brian said, you know, I, I can manage you as songwriters. And they agreed to that as well. So that was, a, 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 I thought, an important discovery. And it was quite a shock to realize it had never been 
divulged before by anybody, even mm. the players. Mm -hmm. uh, there were lots and lots of things like that. I mean, the book's just full of full of discovery like that. I mean, to absolutely nail Pete Best's sacking from the Beatles was satisfying, because within the Beatles, it it was it was kind of subject to all these um, conspiracy theories. Uh, and and so many rumours and and so much misinformation and it it had been allowed to run for fifty years without anyone really getting into the absolute truth of it all, so uh, that was satisfying as well. Um, I, I and, wanted to talk to yeah. you about that because we we just had David Bedford on our show uh, mm -hmm. a few programs ago, and he was talking about you you had said in your book, and this is the first time anyone had said this that the June 6, 1962 recording session was not an audition. That was really their first recording session because they already had a record contract by that time, correct? Correct. And David said that George Martin didn't sign the contract until July of 62. Yes. You... That, that's not right. That's not right. I'm afraid that David is not right about that. I, I, I didn't hear what he said to you, but I heard what he said to... A rival podcast, shall we say? Um, <laughs> other podcast who exists, <laughs> but we don't talk about them. Um, now, I heard what he had to say. I listened with great care to what he had to say because he, he's been making allegations or suggestions that he's got these things for the first time. And I'm not an egomaniac. I'm perfectly prepared to accept the fact that I might have missed something, but I wanted to hear what it was I might have missed. Mm. So I listened with great care to what he said, and I'm, I didn't. Um, I was satisfied at the end of it that that I was correct in in what I'd found, and that his interpretation is not right. And also, uh, he couldn't uh, possibly right. know when George Martin signed that contract. By the by, the way, George Martin never did sign the contract. It wasn't George Martin's contract to sign. It was signed by a director of EMI Records, by the director of the Gramophone Company, in fact, to be precise. Okay. Yeah. Well, just just one more thing about David. He did say that Brian Epstein approached three other drummers to join the Beatles before asking Ringo. It, Is it's all covered that? quite. Yes, it's covered quite exhaustively in Tune In. I interviewed yes. Bobby Graham, who is one of these three who since died, but I did speak to him. I'm glad to say before he left us. Um, I also spoke to Johnny Hutch um, of the Big Three, Johnny Hutchinson. Um, who would not have wanted to join the Beatles. Look, the reality is that they weren't expecting to have Ringo until the end of the Butlin season. Uh, and yet they they were, so they were scouting around for a short-term fill-in to bridge the gap between Pete Best leaving and Ringo joining. But in the end, no such person was needed because Ringo left Butlin's early uh, mm -hmm. and came back to Liverpool and joined the Beatles when they wanted him. So that's that's the story of that one. What I find with the David Bedford research is that he uses it, he uses things selectively, at the same time disregarding much else. I mean, the Beatles wanted Ringo. To say that the Beatles didn't want Ringo is to disregard George Harrison going around to Ringo's mother's house saying, "Tell your Ringo we want him and get in touch." Well, I don't think that should be disregarded. Mm. Uh, um, oh. No, I. No, there there were reasons why other drummers were approached. Um, incidentally, the third drummer that he mentioned, the, I've forgotten his name now, but the chap from one of the Liverpool groups, uh, I've read a, a full interview with him done in the 1990s, and he never mentioned it. So I, I don't I don't count that one. So no, I just think with research, if you're going to do it really thoroughly, you have to use the totality of it, not just cherry pick the bits that suit the story you wish to tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where Ringo is concerned, I'm not sure if this was covered in other books, but one thing that I found interesting in Tune In was when you mentioned that Ringo, before he met Maureen, was actually engaged to another girl. Geraldine. And, mm. Yes. And, um, you know, he had to make a decision between staying at his job, which he's talked about, but I don't recall Ringo talking about this other girlfriend of his. And her family and... and and she thought that he was crazy to go with Rory Storm and, and the Hurricanes for the uh, the job at Butlins. Well, he, he, everybody, all of Ringo's family and friends said that he was crazy to go off and throw in his apprenticeship. You see, growing up in Liverpool uh, or anywhere else in Britain at that time, if you were working class and you didn't have a, a great education, 
Uh, I mean, the education on offer was okay, but not everyone's going to pass every exam because that's just the way it slices. Mm. Your best bet for uh, an assured employment in the future and an assured income is to get an apprenticeship of some kind. So you would apprentice to become a plumber or a bricklayer or a builder or an electrician or something like that, some manual job. But you would learn it very thoroughly and you would pass exams in it. And as a consequence, you would be you would always have that qualification behind you. And in a working class environment like Ringo was growing up in, um, the uncertainty of living on the dole, you know, drawing unemployment benefit was such that it was a great thing to have a trade. And and every family would impress upon their children, their sons particularly, to get a trade. And Ringo started an apprenticeship in 1956, was it? It was 56, yeah, um, which was for five years. And at the end of that, he would be a qualified joiner. I think it was a qualifying to be a joiner or a fitter. I always forget which one it is. It's in the book anyway. Um, and he was three years into that when the offer to go to Butlins with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes came up and it was a three month gig and there was no way he could do that and keep the job. So he had a decision to make of gig or job and three years into a five year apprenticeship, he gave up the apprenticeship and naturally his loved ones, his mother, his stepfather, uh, his girlfriend, his who was by this point, his fiance were up in arms about it. I mean, are you mad? You know, for goodness sake, if you have to drum, then at least finish your qualifications first and then you can always go back to it. But don't give it up before you've actually got your qualification. And that's exactly what he did. And uh, Geraldine was, well, I mean, drumming was a very uncertain future, whereas the man she was going to marry, if he qualified, was always going to have an income. Right. So I incidentally, Geraldine was someone that I looked very hard to find all the time, the 10 years I was spending on tune in. Uh, I never did find her. I mean, I'm very seldom defeated in my quest for people. And, and I particularly enjoy looking for women because the surname usually changes with marriage and that makes the job <laughs> of research even harder. And it's an even greater challenge, which I like. Yeah. Um, but Geraldine was someone I never found. And then I found her after the book came out. Uh, and she lives she lives in America. She emigrated to America in about 1966 uh, and lives there still. And I found her phone number and I knew it was going to be a very tricky call. And the book, of course, is already out, but I can't not phone her uh, because, you know, I'm sure I could learn something from whatever she might tell me. So I kind of sat on the number for a few weeks thinking, oh, this is going to be a tricky one. Uh, but eventually, I just one day I picked up the phone and dialed the number, and she answered. And I introduced myself. She cut across me within about twenty seconds and said, "Honey, I'm not living in the past." Uh, <laughs> and, and, and and that's pretty much the end of that. And she did not want to talk about it. So that was that. But Geraldine is alive and well and living somewhere on the eastern seaboard, I think, if I remember. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. The one thing I yeah. always tell people about Tune In is that. The whole Beatles story is like following a maze where if just one, if something happened differently, it would have changed the whole course of, yeah. of what eventually happened. It's amazing <laughs> that things yeah. fell into place the way they did. Yeah, I mean, it's true in all our lives. Of course, it isn't just true for famous people. Um, but, but the Beatles story hinges on so many of these extraordinary moments. I mean, the, the way they got to go to Scotland to back Johnny Gentle and then even bigger, the way they got to go to Hamburg the first time. I mean, they, they were not they were not first in line to go or second in line. I'm not even sure they were third in line, but they 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 got that gig somehow. And then they had an extraordinary few days when they had to scrabble around and get passports. That was a, a heck of a story that I unearthed for tune in of John only getting his passport, his ticket to ride, as it were, his passport to leave Britain and enter Germany, or enter France, or enter Holland, because they, they, they sailed through the Netherlands uh, and then on the road to Germany. He only got his passport the morning of their departure, and they were going to go anyway without him. It was John, the Beatles were John's group, but they were gonna go. And if John couldn't get a passport, he couldn't get a passport and it was only the very morning. I mean, he literally had to run from the passport office up to Alan Williams's 
jacaranda coffee bar where Williams had his minibus and they went straight off the Hamburg within minutes of his arrival. It was Ugh. that fine. And the drama of him getting the passport was an extraordinary story that had never been told. Um, so I was, I was delighted to tell that. Similarly, when they went the second time, Pete and Paul couldn't get the permit to go. And John and George went without them. And they were just going to play with whoever they could play with. Hmm. Wow. So it was, it was great. Yeah. Docu documents tell these stories. I mean, I didn't know about John Lennon's passport thing until I saw a replica of his passport on display in his house in Liverpool. You know, it's now open to the public, courtesy of the National Trust. Uh, and they have a display of some documents there. And one of them is John Lennon's first passport. And I looked at it and I could see that the date of issue was the 15th of August, 60. And I knew that was the day they'd left. Um, I also had, I had from years ago, I came up at Sotheby's, um, a copy of John Lennon's birth certificate dated the 12th of August, 1960, the date of issue, 12th of August, 60. So, and obviously you couldn't get the passport without the birth certificate. So he had to get a birth certificate before he got his passport. And the reason that he had to get a birth certificate was because Aunt Mimi wouldn't give him the copy that she had. She hid it and wouldn't let him have it. Oh. For exactly the same reason as Ringo, which is, you know, he's, he's done you know, three complete academic years of a four-year art course, and suddenly he wants to chuck it all in and go up to Germany to play guitar. So she, her, her attempt to stop him going, which actually, from an adult point of view, is perfectly understandable, um, was to hide his birth certificate so he couldn't get a passport. <laughs> So the people we know of who actually did listen to their um, relatives and, you know, keep on with what they were doing were Tommy Moore, Chaz Newby. <laughs> um, <laughs> and from this we yeah. learn... <laughs> well, from this we learn that the Beatles are the one story that... that they're the exception, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, one, that wonderful line of Mimi's, that, that little rhyme that she used to have or not rhyme but that couplet of um guitars all right for a hobby but you'll never make a living at it perfectly reasonable thing for any adult to say to a child mm -hmm. perfectly reasonable um but it just so happened that they did jim mack also said to paul you've got to get a proper job you can't earn a living as a musician and he knew that because he had been a musician himself in liverpool playing halls just like paul was attempting to do and that's why paul did go off and get a job at the factory which was another hell of a story to realize that story paul mccartney at massey and coggins and to actually be able to quote paul mccartney saying i wanted to give up the beatles because i fancied being a manager at this factory and he has said that I mean, they're, they're his own words. They're not mine. Um, and, and in Mike McCartney's first book, which I think in America was called The Max, but in Britain was called Thank You Very Much, because we knew what that meant. It was, hit, it was a hit, hit record um, in this country. He reproduced really small in the margin of one of the pages a letter that Paul had received from Massey and Coggins Limited in closing his his kind of end of employment cards. Um, we would call them a P45 here. Anyone who's British know what that means is if you end a job, you get given this card that has a record of how much tax you've paid and so on. You give it to your next employer so that you can re-enter the tax system at the right place. And so I, I was sitting in my office one day and I was literally looking at Mike's book with a magnifying glass. And I saw that letter that's reproduced very small, uh, but there is, Paul's letter from Massey and Coggins and in very small print at the bottom are the names of the directors of the company. So these are the guys who ran the company that Paul worked for. So I went straight to the telephone directory and there were only, I don't remember how many names, three names or something. And I found one of them. It was a Saturday. I phoned him up just out of the blue, complete cold call and spoke to this old gentleman in Liverpool, probably about 85 years old who, it turned out, had interviewed Paul McCartney for this job in 1961 and given him the job and knew him from that time and told me all about Paul's little time at Massey and Coggins when he gave up being a Beatle for a few weeks. Well, he didn't quite give it up, but he was trying to do both things at the same time until John gave him an ultimatum of his either the job or the group, and he gave up the job, um, which was a story that Neil Aspinall had told me 
So I'm on long rambling answers here. Anyway, I found this guy who had given Paul the job and he, I was able to write the Massey and Coggins period of Paul's life from a point of view of real authority because, you know, this guy knew what he was talking about. It was his factory, his company. He knew it. And he'd interviewed Paul. And he was also so charming. And he said, do you ever see Paul? And I said, well, yeah, from time to time. And he said, would you please tell him that I send my regards and that, tell him that I think he's done very well for himself. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, you can be sure that I will. And indeed I did. I did tell Paul. Yeah. He's done okay. He's done okay. Yeah. yeah. He was, it was the right thing to do. But Neil Aspinall told me in one of our conversations that John had, I don't know if this is a, a podcast in which you can swear or not, but just imagine the word. I won't say it, but John had told him to <clears throat> come along, uh, turn up at the cavern today or you're out. Right. And that was when Paul went over the wall, as he, he's described it in a few interviews, how he bunked over the wall and ran down into, into Liverpool from the top of the hill where the factory was and got on stage in the cavern. And, and John said, right, you've given up your job. Yeah. And it was, just, it was as fine as that. Yeah. Hmm. The Beatles' history is full of these stories, and they, they were all pretty much unrealized until someone came along, and it happened to be me, who actually did the extra legwork to find what the true stories are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's one more one of the things that I found most fascinating, which you and I have talked about, was uh, towards the end of 1961, before Brian came along, the Beatles were really on the verge of breaking up. Yes. Yeah, that's um, – now, I make it – I'll say it again now because it, it's, I say it in all the pieces I ever do. Uh, I wasn't there for any of this. So I'm merely the historian who's coming along and researching it as thoroughly as I can and as, and as even-handedly as I can. But I wasn't actually there. Mm. So how do we know that the Beatles were about to break up? Um, because it was said with complete authority by a man who had the authority, which was Bob Wooler. Now, Bob Wooler – if anyone listening to this knows that name, they probably will know it because he was the the DJ at the Cavern Club. Pretty much every time the Beatles played there, Bob Wooler was the man who introduced them on stage and would play the records before and afterwards and so on, basically running the show. But beyond that, Bob was also doing the same things at most of the places the Beatles played that weren't the Cavern because they didn't only play the Cavern. They played all over Merseyside. Mm. And Bob Wooler was, was there most nights, and he became very close to them. Never as close from their point of view as they would have liked, because Bob was a secretive soul. But in terms of access to them, and I mean not only watching them on stage, but having a drink with them before, having a drink with them afterwards, going in the van with them and all of that, being really close, he made it absolutely clear that the Beatles were about to break up had Brian Epstein not come along at the very moment that he did. Brian came along, entered their lives in the very nick of time. And why were they going to break up? For all the reasons that we would wish. The reasons being that they were restless. They were restless souls, the Beatles. They never wanted to do any one thing for very long. The very musical progression that we also admire, that takes them from, from me to you to tomorrow never knows in three years. That same restlessness, that same we don't want to repeat ourselves was prevalent before they ever had a recording contract. It's in their DNA. And they were bored playing in Liverpool because they had hit the ceiling. They had hit the glass ceiling. They couldn't get any more money. They couldn't play any different places. They were on what was called the circuit, which literally meant Aintree Institute on a Saturday night. Um, the Cavern on a Sunday night, uh, I don't know, what, Majestic Birkenhead on a Thursday night, New Brighton Tower on a Friday night, and it became boring for them. They were the biggest, they were the best, they got the most extraordinary reaction from people, but it was a circuit, it was just going round and round and round and round and round and getting bored. And Brian came along just at the very moment when they were about to break it, uh, because they were bored. So that's how slender the thread can be sometimes. Really amazing. Why don't we pass you over to Steve? Well, thank thank you, Ken. Uh, hello, Mark. Um, I got. Uh, I, I hope I have enough time to ask everything I, I can ask. But let me start with the uh, a question about uh, Rory Storm versus the Beatles. Um, when Ringo left Rory Storm and was taken into the Beatles, what 
Uh, what was the difference between playing with Rory Storm and playing with the Beatles? If if that question makes sense, kind of sense. Well, when Ringo left the Beatles for when Ringo left Rory Storm and the Hurricanes for the Beatles, it wasn't the first time he left them. It was the second time he left them. He left them. Uh, New Year's, he knew pretty much just as the Beatles were going down to Decca to, to test for Decca Records. Mm-hmm. Ringo left the Hurricanes and went off to play in Germany for a while and indeed would have been there and not been available to the Beatles were it not for the most terrible flood that occurred in Hamburg that killed nearly 400 people uh, and closed the clubs for a while and Ringo came back to Liverpool and, and therefore was around when the Beatles needed him. So that was an extraordinary thing as well. The Hurricanes were a good group for what they did, but they never progressed. If you saw the Hurricanes in 59 and 61 and 63 and even 65, you saw the same the same act mm-hmm. with the same tricks. And they were kind of stage entertainers. You know, Rory would do strange things on stage, athletic things on stage, which were great if you saw them once and, and maybe pretty good if you saw them a second time. But you didn't need to keep going to see them because you'd see the same show every time. Whereas the Beatles, as we've just been saying, um, they were evolving constantly. When I first read Mersey Beat literature in the mid 70s, Alan Williams's first book, for example, I had the impression that Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were the biggest group in Liverpool and the Beatles were second. The reality is that the Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were perhaps, probably, the biggest group in Liverpool until the Beatles got back from Hamburg on the, off, after their first trip. And then they were never the biggest group again, the Hurricanes, because the Beatles were so, they eclipsed them completely. And there's a great anecdote in the book from, I think, Johnny Guitar and also a guy called Dave Jameson, who was kind of the Hurricanes roadie. That they were watching the Beatles one night at Aintree Institute in January 61 and realised that the Beatles had just gone, they'd raced ahead of them and that there was no catching them. So Ringo was delighted to join the Beatles um, because they were going places and they were, they were clearly so much more interesting as musicians than the Hurricanes were. And there's no disrespect to Johnny Guitar and people like that who I got to know and like, but really the Beatles were in a field of their own. So Ringo was delighted to join the Beatles and, and, be, and because, you know, the, the prospects were very bright and they were not bright with the Hurricanes, which is why he'd already left them. Um, incidentally, there was another time in 61 when he was going to leave them and join Jerry and the Pacemakers, Ringo, as bass guitarist, would you believe? Really? Because they already had a drummer, but he wanted to join them. So he was going to play, learn to play bass guitar and join the, he would have been on the front line in Jerry and the Pacemakers. Hmm. It was more of a, of a kind of. It was more of a of a the beer talking that one, but they did discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> wow! I'll just you, take lessons from that, Stu. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stu, who ended up being a fairly good bass guitarist, by the way, he, he was not rubbish all the time, Stuart. It was only mm. the beginning that he could play it. Mm. Mm. Do you think that the um, uh, when Ringo joined the Beatles, that um, they they were transformed um, into the Fab Four? Um, I mean, did, did Beatles transfer, um, um, change them from a, you know, a rough rock and roll group to a polished group that they became? I mean, was that the moment? Well, the, the first thing to say in, in, in Pete's favour is that, the, um, but particularly in John Paul and George's favour, is that while Pete was their drummer, they did conquer all in Liverpool. So it wasn't like the Ringo transformed them from rubbish to brilliant. Um, they were already brilliant enough to have got you know, to be winning the, the popularity poll, to have made a record in Germany, to have been to, to have attracted a manager, to have now got a recording contract. So, and that was all with Pete. But it wasn't because of Pete that it happened. I mean, I, I, I've been assured that when the Beatles first went to Abbey Road in June '62, which was the only time they ever went there with Pete as the drummer, that he literally, literally did not say a word on that occasion. They never heard him speak. And he just did not have the personality that dovetailed with John, Paul and George, who you couldn't really shut up, you know, because they always had something to say for themselves. The final word in answer to your question really should come from Neil Aspinall, because he no one was ever closer to the Beatles than Neil. And Neil had the unique angle of not only being extremely close to the Beatles all the way through from 1959, 60, 
until his death in 2008. Um, but he was also very close to the Best family. In fact, he lived at the house where, you know, Pete and his mother and brother lived. Mm -hmm. So he had a foot in both camps. And Neil said this to me about the joining of sacking of Pete and the joining of Ringo. Pete being his best mate and Ringo being his employer. Neil said uh, they had a succession of drummers through the years. And finally, now with Ringo, they had one who integrated, who fitted. Until that point, it was always John, Paul, George and a drummer. Now it was John, Paul, George and Ringo. Mm -hmm. And that tells you everything. It was the chemistry was not right before Ringo. It was right on the front line, but it wasn't the chemistry with the, the guy at the back was not correct mm -hmm. uh, until Ringo. And then it was right. I mean, it didn't necessarily happen immediately, but undoubtedly it was the great move. Um, and, and, uh, I found a 1965 interview with Brian Epstein in which he said that the Beatles bringing Ringo into the group was a brilliant thing to do that he didn't see the value of at the time, but he realized it by 65, of course. Uh -huh. And given Neil's ties to the Best family, that's a pretty amazing statement for him to make. Well, um, Neil was always a most extraordinary guy because he could be loyal to both sides simultaneously. Not mm -hmm. many people could do that, but he could. Mm -hmm. Let me let me ask a question about your, your research because we've been t we've been talking a little bit about that earlier, and you've talked about getting phone numbers and and doing basic detective work. Uh, you know, almost uh, I mean, like a, r a reporter. How hard is that to do, especially now as the years go on? Um, I mean, you know, just uh, the, find that story about Geraldine was was amazing really because i mean she's basically an unknown and you man managed to find her uh, are there some you know what's the hardest story that you can remember or the hardest thing you've had to dig up that that you've been able to find oh gosh i mean the the research for tune in well it comes on top of all the research i've been doing since the late 70s into the beatles anyway mm -hmm. but really for for that book alone i i began it in 2003 so uh, that's already 14 years ago. And I forget the kind of the day-to-day -day nitty gritty of it. You kind of forget. Another one that really delighted me, however, was I was intent on tracking down the, well, the three people who I knew were involved in the first ever Beatles, Beatles fan club. If you've seen the film Good Old Frida, you'll know the name Frida Kelly, mm -hmm. uh, best, best associated with the Beatles fan club, but she didn't start it. In fact, she only, she was a member of it. The club was actually started by other people uh, to begin with. And um, it was started by two young women, two teenage girls, uh, and, a, and a Liverpool boy called Bernard Boyle, Bernie Boyle. And I was intent on tracking them all down. And I, as I said, I'm seldom defeated, but they were hard to find. And eventually, however, I did find all three of them. Bernie Boyle turned up in the most extraordinary way while I was in New York one time. I went to visit peter brown as actually as it happens and he said um oh while you're here i've got somebody else dropping in on me later a guy from liverpool in fact and i said oh who's that he said his name is uh, boyle bernard boyle and i went bernie boyle from liverpool is coming here <laughs> yes yes i said how old is he oh he'll be about uh, about mid 60s i would think and i said i might i think he's the guy i've been looking for for years and he walked into the room while i was there I mean, after years of looking for this man and not finding him, he walked into the room in which I was sitting having a cup of tea. <laughs> so, um, and Bernie Boyle's anecdotes for Tune In are just extraordinary because he was so often in the van with them and backstage with them. And there's no bullshit there with Bernie. It's all good stuff. Um, and then I found these two girls um, who Bernie hadn't seen forever, you know, for 50 years. But I found them both eventually. And it turned out that they had briefly managed the Beatles, which I knew nothing about. Wow. And so in between Alan Williams and Brian Epstein, the Beatles had two teenage girls managing them for a blink of an eye. But it did happen. Hmm. Hmm. So, you know, yeah. life is full of surprises. People go, oh, we know all there is to know about the Beatles. No, we do not. No one, as I said, no one knows everything about anything. But even a story as, as, as you know, with, with 500 books written about it, you, you, there's so much that we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. One of the things I... I... The next two books as well, by the way. That's true for volumes two and three. 
Well, then, since you brought them up, um, <laughs> uh, are are they uh, on track to come out when you have said they, they're going to come out? Or, or can we expect them sooner rather than later? What, a, what an artfully phrased question. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I'm, well, uh, my answer is, is, is a truthful one, which is I'm still trying to get them out as soon as I can, and I'm, I'm aiming for the date of 2020. Uh, you may have heard me say that in other interviews, and I, I'm mm-hmm. being no less or more truthful now than I was there. The reality as we approach the end of 2017 and head into 2018 is that I, it's getting harder to envisage me getting these out by 2020 or the first the volume two out by 2020. I can't describe how big this job is. The job is actually as big as I choose to make it um, because I could cut corners and, 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 you know, I could have been writing five years ago. I certainly had enough material five years ago, um, but I knew I didn't have everything that there was that needed to be found in order to write this book and write this history, which is really what's important with the utmost thoroughness and care uh, and turning up all these extraordinary stories that we just don't know. And this really is the book or the series of books in which these things have to be written. So it's taking a long time because I work alone and the the task is enormous. So um, long answer to your question. Uh, It'll be out as soon as possible, but I don't think it'll be out in 2020, volume two, no. Hmm. Okay, you work alone? Yes. Wow. I, I okay. That's I'm, an interesting. I'm right at this very moment, I'm I'm looking to I'm looking to change that. But at this very moment, I'm alone, and I have been all from the beginning. I have, on occasion, when I've had a bit of extra money invested in some assistance. Uh, I mean, I still do all my own research and my own writing, but there are things that one can find assistance for, mm-hmm. um, and I have. But that's only on a, an occasional basis, never a full time. Okay, a couple more qu- quick questions because I don't want to hog up the time. If you can say, where have you been in your research lately? Uh, yeah, I can say, but it's it's. In fact, this goes back to one of the questions you asked earlier, which is that though there is great value to be found still in interviewing people, that value is has diminished since this project began fourteen years ago. Mm-hmm the age of people now um and i'm I've, i i noticed about two years ago and it's certainly been reinforced a few times since then with thankfully some honorable exceptions the value of interviewing people is diminishing because the people i'm talking to are now in their 80s right um and and often, if they're alive at all they're of poor health um their memories are going it's you know I, I'm not getting the quality of material out of people that I was 14 years ago, mm-hmm. so I do fewer interviews now. But I did do a lot up front for volumes two and three, knowing that this would occur. I mean, I did realise right from the outset that there were certain people I'd better interview early because they wouldn't be early by the time of volume three. So I mean, you know, who who knows who's going to be around when volume three comes out? I might not be around when volume three comes out it might not even come out i mean anything's possible we don't know about tomorrow all all we can do is just you know do our best and hope Mm -hmm. but um so i haven't been doing so much traveling um i will be going to rishikesh i'm pleased to say quite soon because i need to go and see that place i do go to most of the places i write about Uh, i did have a great trip to scranton pennsylvania last year to go and see the Capitol records pressing plant Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a bit that thrill uh, and to meet the guy who used to manage it and interview him about the workings of the factory. Not that I'm writing at length about that, but what I do write, I need to get right. So uh, that was great. I spend my time reading and turning up documents, uh, and even more so than in Volume 1, um, Volumes 2 and 3 will be document-based histories. Mm-hmm. Did you did, did you have um, which, them to see? is all new stuff. In, in terms of traveling, did you happen to, to see what I did when I was in Capitol Records uh, last year? They opened the door to this room, and they had all the tape boxes, including Hollywood Bowl, in there. Uh, or this was before the Hollywood Bowl CD came out. Have you been in that room? Have you seen that room in, in Hollywood? I haven't, no. I haven't. Should, I have been in – Let me see. Well, I, I, you I, should go I don't there. think I'll get access to it now. Um, oh, really? I, because it's kind of those those opportunities have been closed to me, unfortunately. Ah. 
I mean, there's a lot of politics in a job like this, which I don't often right. go into, but, but there is a lot of politics that I have to deal with, even though, even though it's nothing to do with me. I, I kind of, it does impinge on what I do. No, but I have seen photos of the tape boxes, which I'm pleased about. And, of course, I saw the Hollywood Bowl tapes when they were at Abbey Road 30 years ago, because that's where yeah. they used to be kept. Let me ask to, like, two more quick questions. I've messaged you about auction items. Are there any auction items that you can recall recently that really got you excited in terms of your research? Yeah, all the time. All the time. That's actually sort of a, a, an invaluable source of, of research is, is keeping an eye on all the auctions and indeed on eBay um, for pieces of paper or whatever that might mm-hmm. come up that actually sheds some light. A lot of you know unique material does come up. There's a memorabilia dealer, a dealer in England, in Britain, called Trax. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy who runs that, he spends his life finding people who were witness to events or were party to circumstances. And usually uh, at some point or other, at, someone, at some point in someone's life, they'll decide to part with whatever it is they've got. And a lot of interesting stuff comes through his hands and I get to see all of it. And I learn from every single piece of paper. Rockaway Perry Cox, who I associate with Rockaway Records in L.A., um, had a load of um, Hollywood Bowl documents on the eBay page a few months back. Uh, and he very kindly uh, let me see those. So, yeah, there's, there's still good stuff coming up. And indeed, there's material in archives all over the world, legally on deposit in places that people don't think to look. I mean, quite often when I go to a place to, to look at something, I'll, I'll be the only one who's ever done it. Even though we're all interested in the Beatles, not necessarily is everyone out there looking for pieces of paper like I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of the most delightful interviews I saw you do was the one with Conan O'Brien. Yes. And and I have to ask you, how did you hook up and did you know he knew so much about the Beatles? Yeah, we don't get Conan O'Brien's show in England, so I know his name because I am, I'm interested in television, but uh, most people in Britain don't know who he is. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, a mutual friend contacted me about five years ago and said that Conan O'Brien, you probably have heard of him, and I said, yes, yes, I think he's got a talk show. Well, he's coming to England and he wants to go around Abbey Road. Can you arrange it for him? And um, my contacts at Abbey Road have varied through the years. I used to know everybody there, and now I know almost nobody um, because of natural turnover of staff. But there was somebody I could ask, and a tour was arranged, and I went on this tour as well because I always like to go around Abbey Road, even though I know the place well. It's it's always Mm -hmm. nice to have another. So I went on this with him, and we went out for a coffee afterwards, and he said, "Um, you know, come on my show sometime. I do this He's got the TV show, which is, you know, that kind of, you know, the, the hyper-American talk show. Mm-hmm. And he's got this excellent thing called Serious Jibber Jabber, which is a one-on-one conversation and that goes deep into the subject. And that, that's the kind of thing I like to do anyway. So I said, sure. And um, it eventually happened in 27, 2016. And, um, yeah, it was great. I, I enjoyed it. And he really does know his stuff. I mean, he's a major fan. We went out for dinner afterwards and we did carry on Beatles conversations the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he really is a, a, a great scholar of the Beatles. Okay, Alan, back to you. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, I think we all probably have another two or three million questions about the books um, and the the All These Years project, but uh, since you're here, um, you do have some other things, too, that I think the uh, listeners should hear about a little um, if they haven't run into them. One is your photo book, which has just come out. Oh. Just, so um, tell yeah. us about that. An Englishman um, in Mons, is it called? Yeah, Mons, uh, Mons is a town in Belgium, uh, a, a, an interesting historical town, although that's mere coincidence. I, I don't have much spare time because I'm full on on these books, but I do occasionally when I put my pen down and stop tapping away at my computer, I do go out uh, and usually on my own and I walk around the back streets of places and, and take photographs of historical things, not major historical things like important churches or important buildings. I like to take ordinary stuff like houses and windows and fences and lampposts and anything authentic historical uh, element to it 
mm-hmm. something from the 19th century. Mons is a lovely town in Belgium that has an annual Beatles festival. Mm-hmm. And in 2012, 2012, I was invited to go there and speak. And I did. And on that was on the Saturday. And on the Sunday, I had a free day. So I came out of my hotel, turned right, turned left, turned right. And I'm in back streets. And I just started taking photographs and got myself lost for a few hours, walked, I don't know, quite a few miles, took about 400 photographs. And it became an exhibition in Mons called An Englishman in Mons, pictures of a town that are not obvious. And um, we invited all the people from the town to come to the exhibition on the opening night, or a lot, a lot of them anyway, uh, and to tell me by looking at the pictures where in their town I had been. And very few people recognized the places because it's the truth that no matter where you live on the planet, we're all so busy going about our daily lives that you tend not to notice the, your immediate environment it's just there and you take it for granted so i came along as a stranger and took pictures of their town and they didn't know where i'd been <laughs> so and that exhibition has now become a book uh, and i may do more books but i mean really I, I'm, I'm not going to allow anything to get in the way of the beatles project this is just a sideline but i do have a photo an eye for photography mm-hmm. and it is still the work of a historian it's just different instead of being in a library and typing something on my computer, I'm out there looking for things. But it's still history, and and it's all part of the same process. And actually, I do a lot of my Beatles thinking while I'm out on those walks, which I dictate into a little recorder and then type up when I get back to my desk. So Mm -hmm. even then, I'm still working on the Beatles book, but I do take a lot of pictures as well. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's nice. Yeah, you can you can get it on on um, there's an English an Englishman in Mons dot be is the website. Okay, hmm. and you also had uh, this is now not that recently, but within the last couple of years, did the uh, the text for a book of Hard Day's Night photographs, which I guess in a way dovetails with the bit you're working on for the next volume as well. Yes. Uh, the 50th anniversary of A Hard Day's Night was in 2014, and there was a, a beautiful Criterion Collection DVD of that, um, which I was involved with. And there's a, there's a half-hour interview with me as one of the bonus features. Uh, and that introduced me to uh, a delightful couple who own A Hard Day's Night, uh, Bruce and Martha Karsh, a Californian couple, mm-hmm. who literally own A Hard Day's Night, because... They bought it from the estate of the producer, Walter Shenson, after, well, obviously after Walter passed away. And as part of the archive, they didn't only buy, they didn't only get the film when they bought A Hard Day's Night as a property. They got the archive that came with it, which was about two and a half thousand photographs that the unit photographer on A Hard Day's Night had taken, only a tiny percentage of which had ever been seen. Um, And... After the DVD, suddenly uh, Martha Karsh came up with the idea of doing a book of the best of the photographs. And would I write the text for it, which I was delighted to do, because it is territory I'm covering anyway in in volume two. It's not really a a distraction. The the, the money that it paid me enabled me to pay for some help on TuneIn, which uh, on uh, the next volume of the, the trilogy. And it also enabled me to get to see the rest of the archive, which I, I, I have now done, which is the, the document side of Walter Shenson's productions, which will enable me to write about both A Hard Day's Night and help with a great more uh, precision and enlightenment. I learned all sorts of things about the making of those films that I didn't know. Uh, it wasn't relevant to write it in the photo book, uh, for which I did the essay and the captions. Mm-hmm. But the I, I do now have the knowledge of, of so much more about those films than I had before. Mm-hmm. I was just going to ask, did Apple try to acquire the rights once Walter Shenson passed away? I, I, I ought not to say too much on this because it's it's for Bruce or Martha to, to, to divulge that if they want to. But okay. I understand I understand that um, Bruce did move first, um, and Apple probably would have made a move for it if they could have done. Uh, they they co-own help. The Karshes and Apple co-own help. And they have a very good, mutual, respectful working relationship, the two parties. Um, so they, it's always going to be constructive. You know, it's, 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 it's good. Okay. A hard, day's night, a hard Day's Night and Half of Help are in the hands of a, very, a respectful owner. Very, it's very good. Good situation. 
I, I always wondered about that. Um, thank you for addressing that. Um, mm. Walter oh, Shanks had a reversion clause in his contract with the United Artists that the film reverted to him after 15 years. So in 1979, Walter Shenson became the outright owner of A Hard Day's Night. Mm -hmm. Mm. Anyway, carry on. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah. Can I just ask two quick questions here? And you can give quick answers because I know we're pressed for time. One of the things that we're asked a lot here are which Beatle books we recommend. What Beatle books mm. do you think are the best ones out there? Oh, Mark? <laughs> And are well, there any I that mean, you've used for your research, for, you know? Oh, of course. Of course. I mean, I, mean, I, 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 mean, I'm, I may be the only person doing this full time, but there's a lot of people who have done some excellent Beatles research, present company included, um, you know, through the years into different elements of it. So absolutely, there are, there are many books that are, are well worthwhile. In fact, there's probably something of value in every book. Um, but there are some books that are I turn to instantly for for help. But I think your question is so broad that you kind of need to subdivide it into categories because mm. there are. And how do you put a photo book over a discographical book or a you know a, um, a memoir? You know, right. I mean, they're all all these books are valuable in their own right. And I thought so, that in the last few years there have been so many really good ones. Oh, the magnificent, magnificent! Yeah. If, for example, you're writing about the American tours which I will be, you can bet your life that Chuck Gunderson's books are going to be on my desk. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I won't use only those because that will be plagiarism. And also, I have extra information. But undoubtedly, he's done research in places that I wouldn't have done. And, and I know that he's good, so I can trust it. So, so there's one. I mean, there are Chip Madinger's book about John Lennon, for example. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of work. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, anybody who devotes x number of years to one element of the story by definition they're going to be going deeper than i can because i, I have to tell such a broad story as well as a deep story so any book that goes deep on any one thing is is of value um, right i always turn back to harry castleman and wally Pedrazic's discography books from the mid 70s which mm -hmm. made a huge impact on me at that time mm -hmm. you know yeah. if, if i if I need a release date, I'd probably go to those books first because I know how to use them best, you know? Yeah, Altogether Now is one of the most worn-out books <laughs> in my yeah. library, so... Right, yeah. 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 Uh, and, you know, th there, are, there are all these great books. I mean, there are undoubtedly some books that we probably didn't need, but for the most part, there are books that we do. The Genesis Publications books, I mean, they're, they're terrific um, because, you know... Books with access to original things, like the Book of Ringo's photographs, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't see that stuff anywhere else. So, so mm. of course, there are a great many books that are important. Sure. All right, one more thing. Uh, since you've done so much research on the Beatles, what would you say if you can pinpoint one or even two misconceptions that have been made through the years by the general public uh, about them? What would they be? Oh, I don't know. I really don't. There's so there, many there, times I'll look online and somebody will post something, say, on Facebook, and it's just so wrong. <laughs> and there have got to be some well, things yeah. that you'll see all the time and it'll, it'll just infuriate you, you know? Yes. Um, well, I'm obviously, with the Internet age, we're all able to publish our thoughts and our, what we believe to be right. Um, and, and, you know, quite often it's not. Very often it's not. I, I don't really regard, pay any regard to that stuff anymore. I mean, my head is so full of what did happen that I, I don't really worry about silly things that people say, you know. Sounds like a line from a song, doesn't it? But <laughs> no, I, I, it's, it's such a broad question that I can't think of a precise answer. Um, I don't think that the Beatles as people in, and the way that they conducted their lives through the Beatle years is a properly well-known story uh, i don't and, and on that basis i think you could probably extrapolate it and say that i don't think people who think they know those guys know them as well as they think they do <laughs> does that make sense i think sure. you're going to be a lot closer to them and their heads once you've read the next two volumes in the trilogy because i've got such strong access to immediate stuff that they said or did at the time and i think we will know them a lot better and I think we will come to look back on earlier periods of time, like the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, when we thought we knew them and realized we probably didn't know them. Mm -hmm. 
And that's actually a um, big thing because we the 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 whole machinery around the Beatles has been calibrated to make us feel that we know them really, really well. Well, and 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 in many respects, we do know them well, but I just don't think we know them well enough. I think there's so much more to it than <laughs> than we usually read. Uh, I mean, Beatle books have a tendency these days to go from album to album, and 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 the, my next two books won't. They'll just go from day to, from day to day, and what happens in between the albums is is of equal interest. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Um, anyway, I haven't, I haven't started writing it yet, so I can't really exactly predict how it's going to flow. But I do know the material I've got. So, do you know when you're going to start writing it, Mark? I hope to be writing within a year. Okay. Uh, and then and then I will just crack through it as quickly as I can go, without cutting any corners are you going to do it in the same way writing everything you need to write and then having the possibility yeah. of of two different editions long and short i think it's highly highly likely i mean various people have said to me um they're not they can't see how i can fit even say the next four years into a book the size of tune in right um, because there is such a lot to say, and indeed there, there is. It's, it's a massive, massive story now. Um, and I don't just mean the Beatles were big and popular, selling millions of records. I mean, the story explodes, it goes everywhere, and for me to cover it, it's going to be a very, very tricky thing to write. Tune In was a very tricky book to write in the sense of threading it the way I did and making it seem seamless and so on. But the next story, at least that most of it was taking place in, in one city in one time. Um, the next book, it really does go pretty much global. And I need to be covering pretty much all of it simultaneously without losing sight of the main subjects all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be a, a real challenge to actually just construct it. Um, so it's not just I can sit and rattle off 10,000 words a day because some days on a book like this, you, you only write a page or two because the construction of it is so intricate. But but I know I can do it. it but, you know, how long it takes is how long it takes, really. You know, that's, that's the reality of it. Would breaking the book up into more volumes help get it out, get the, the next one out sooner? Um, it probably, well, yes, I think it would because I do write them in a forward direction. So I will be, by the time I write 65, 63 and 4 will be behind me. And could conceivably, I suppose, be just hived off and published. But I don't want to keep confusing the marketplace. This is meant to be a trilogy, and I intend for it to remain a trilogy. Ultimately, once it's all out, they can be carved up into different years and so on. Um, but I, I, you know, I think I should just stick to the game plan and just do three books, and then at the end, we can do other things with them if we want to. Okay. Is the plan for Volume 2 to go through the end of 1966, or is it going to go beyond that? I don't think it'll go beyond the end of 66. I'm not sure where in 66 it'll finish. And as I've said a few times, I don't need to know that yet, because <laughs> it's only the writing of it that I'll know. But I'm pretty certain, I'm sure it won't go into 67. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so Sergeant Pepper is Volume 3, and Volume 3 is... 10 years away at least mm -hmm. yeah mm. big I, job this. yeah big job sorry. yeah <laughs> huge job sure is yes I, I know several people who would volunteer to help you <laughs> <laughs> three of them are sitting right here <laughs> yeah. yeah you know I had so many wonderful offers of help from not only people I know but people I don't know you know people who just correspond with me by email through my website or something genuinely sincerely offering all the help they can but it's very, very hard to delegate on a project like this i'm not a great delegator anyway hmm. but it, it's very hard to delegate and because i, I do it all best myself I, I don't know how good other people what they could do for me and 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 how how trustworthy it would be so it's much easier to do it all yourself um it's very much in my character to just be kind of sitting in isolation doing all this perfectly happily with the door closed and not be having to deal with too many people offering me things that, you know, I'm not so certain about. So I welcome every offer, but I usually say thank you, but no thank you, because it would just become it would just become a mess, I think. Are you planning to do any U.S. Pr uh, promotional appearances because of the extended uh, version coming out? 
Yeah, this is this is it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it. you're not going to do any personal appearances like you did for the first for, for the initial publication. Uh, if you look on YouTube, there's um, when I was in LA in last year doing some research in a, in, a, in an archive in Los Angeles. I was interviewed by Stephen Peoples on camera, and that's he's divided that into four nice, easily watchable chunks. And we talk a lot about the extended edition in that, even though at that point it wasn't yet available in the US, other than by post. We do talk about it, so you could look at that. But no, really, you know, any interviews I do like this, which is very welcome, um, they, they're a distraction, really. I mean, you know, the last hour and a half, I could have been doing volume two. So you don't want to be responsible for putting it up any more than that, do you? No. Okay. God, no. So, so thank you for giving us that. Journey. So thank you for giving us that hour and a half. And um, <laughs> We should wrap this up, and um, so thank you again for for coming on and updating you, us. Yes, and um, so we we just will go around and uh, say how to contact us. Um, why don't we start with you, Mark? I mean, is there a way if people need to contact you that they should do it? Website. Uh, I have a really terrible website which I never even look at, and I certainly never update. It's called it's Mark www.marklewison.net because somebody took the dot com and didn't use it. Thank you. Um, so it's, it's dot net, and uh, but I never use that either. But I can be reached through it because there is a, an email address within it that that will reach me. So that's about it, really. And I'm on Twitter um, at Mark Lewison, and I'm on Facebook, but I don't tend to do very much on that. If I post on Facebook, it's my wife doing it for me. So um, and that's that's me. That's me. Okay. Um, Steve? Uh, BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. And I have a Beatles News and Information Facebook group. Okay. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. All right. And Ken? Uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Look for a new special contest coming your way the end of this week, Friday or Saturday. Okay, and you can reach me through Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. So for Ken Michael, Steve Marinucci, Mark Lewison this time, uh, I'm Alan Cozen saying thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.